Welcome, everybody. We, we're going to get underway. Um, I'm, I'm so impressed as alums that you've um, honored the century-old tradition of starting very, very late on a Saturday morning. Um, so this is actually pretty, if we, if we start less than half an hour late, it, I think it's a record, um, a, a historic record. So I can't decide whether to praise you for being on time or to criticize you for not understanding that we do these things a little bit later. But since there are already so, much of, so many of you here, I think it'd be great to get underway because we're gonna do a lot of uh, thinking during the day. And, a, and as you know, um, we really think that, that the relationship between the alums and the school is an academic relationship. That is to say, um, you were here originally in order to kind of rethink what is the future of cities, and then you're now in the world continuing that uh, thinking. You're, as it were, thinking on the ground. And so what we would love to do is find ways to exchange your thoughts with our thoughts. And so on the one hand, it's, it's great and it's social and all of that, but it's really not about making sure that you have the letter C uh, tattooed on your, uh, on your buttock and that you uh, know the secret Columbia handshake and have to wear funny pajamas or anything like that. It's really about uh, reconnecting to the aspirations uh, and the kind of optimism that's in the school and, and seeing how that optimism continues to play itself out in your professional uh, uh, environments. And even though the school is sort of famous for creating a platform for its alums to do almost anything in almost any place at almost any <coughs> scale, we are still always totally amazed at, at, in fact, what that means. And so also I think part of the relationship with the alums is learning um, in which way has, has has professional practice uh, uh, evolved. Since perhaps we may be the only school that has uh, 10 years ahead of us as the main horizon, that is to say we're really interested not in the next shape of a building or the next shape of a neighborhood or the next shape of a city actually, but the new shapes of expertise that will be needed 10 years from now because we can't even predict what kind of questions are gonna come up. So what we have to do is um, nurture ideas that the students uh, actually didn't have yet. Right? So we have to sort of nurture their capacity to be leaders 10 years from now. Now because of that, that kind of laboratory uh, uh, position, we always open ourselves to, to the unknown um, and to the most sort of radical potentials. And I think in the past, those potentials should ha would, would normally be located here inside the laboratory. It's always un was understood that a university had the advantage of being disconnected from the city, disconnected from the market, disconnected from the world, uh, even disconnected from your family in a way, uh, in order to reflect with other people from all around the world. And, and in this school, as you know, students are coming from more than 55 countries to do this amazing uh, 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 reflection. Uh, it's New York City, it's an immigrant city, so it's a city in which people are changing directions, that they're rethinking and, and, and rebooting. Uh, it's New York, it means you're only as good as whatever is coming out of your mouth. It really doesn't matter um, so much what you're wearing. Um, uh, but certainly doesn't matter really where you're coming from. Really what matters is where you are going. Right? So everybody in New York is interested in where you are going. And the question, who are you? Uh, the answer is normally where you are going. Most New Yorkers would say, actually, uh, I'm not sure who I am. That's why I'm in New York. It's a kind of asylum for people who haven't figured out who they are. But they know more or less which direction they're going. So in the past, this school had, was an experimental laboratory dedicated to future forms of expertise of, of the evolving city. And, and we would test ideas that might eventually become important ideas uh, in the field and in the profession. But this uh, geometry has been completely reversed over the last, I would say, uh, seven, uh, seven years or so, eight years or so, because the world now changes so fast that every professional has to have some of the skills of a university, has to have a research capacity and an agility and an openness to the future. Every profession is now synergized in a kind of network operation that's global but also cross-disciplinary. In other words, every dream that used to be only possible inside a school is now the reality of practice. So to be uh, experimental today um, means to be professional and to be professional means to be experimental. So we now find ourselves in an entirely different relationship between, between the inside of the school and the outside. So to have uh, a gathering of alums 
is an entirely different thing today than it would have been 10 years ago because really we are expecting to hear from you uh, more interesting things than we can tell you. Whereas in the past, we you would come back, um, you know, you would cry a lot, you would uh, uh, remember, uh, you would have awkward conversations with people that you used to be sleeping with, but there was a problem. Um, um, all of these dramas would go on, like in all of those famous movies about weddings and funerals and so on, have all that sort of quality. And then you would hear from young teachers uh, at the school about what's happening next, and you would hear from some of the senior teachers that really were important mentors for you, and you would leave with a fuzzy feeling um, about life and, and, and so on. And since Columbia is famously not a fuzzy place, we actually never did that. We simply never did that. There was no outreach to alums, no conversation. The reason that there is now an alumni association, which is the most beautiful uh, uh, invention of the last year in this school, is because actually for the school to remain as interesting as it was when you were there, we have to be in continuous dialogue with you about what's happening in the world and what new skill sets you are developing and what new problems you're locating in the, in the world. So the geometry of the school has changed a lot. Um, you know this building, it was designed in um, 1911. Um, you know, we moved slowly uh, uh, uptown. We took our place in the university right aside Long Low Library and the facade of our building says that we know exactly what the future is. The future is ancient Greece, right? <laughs> it's very clear. Um, but as you know, those of you who basically lived in this building when you were students here, inside is the opposite. Inside we say we really, we know everything about ancient Greece, but not just ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, ancient everything. We have the library, we have the world's library of all the good ideas from all the cultures and all the disciplines related to the city here. But this is only our platform for leaping into the unknown. So this facade of the building, which says we know perfectly the future, hides the fact that inside, we are very, very uh, open and uncertain and experimental and testing different ideas. So that has been a beautiful facade. And maybe our discipline, whether it be architecture or urban design or urban planning or preservation or real estate development, maybe our discipline has also, also always had this very clear line. Ar architects are not, um, uh, don't express doubt very much in public. Right? They really stand beside their projects with an almost obscene confidence that what they have done is good for everybody, not just the people that use the building, but anybody that smells the building, uh, uh, sees it on a social network. Somebody looking from Mars at Earth, seeing the work of an architect, would become a better alien simply by virtue of looking, <laughs> by looking at the work of an architect. In other words, this in, the architect's infinite confidence that their work is doing good. And I would say the same is true as you work through all the other disciplines. But of course, inside the head of the architect and inside the studio of the architect is the opposite, a real uh, embrace of doubt and, 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 and curiosity. So what I'm saying is that, of course, the school used to have a facade of confidence behind which is doubt, what's going to happen next. And then we put our best ideas into the world. Professionals who leave the school do the same thing. They have a, a perfectly uh, calm and confident facade, but inside they really don't know what's happening. I think now we, we are reaching a moment in time in which almost every professional in every corner of the world is, is bringing some of the doubt that's usually hidden inside into the professional and academic uh, uh, life and then they are sharing. And you really are in an age in which knowledge is being transferred in a completely new manner. And it's a kind of a, I think a kind of a survival operation. We really realize that cities are now changing in a way that's absolutely uh, unprecedented. A city can go from 5 million to 10 million people in five years. This has never happened in the history of this planet. Uh, the planet is becoming radically urbanized. 85% of the world will be living in cities in, in the next 20 years or so. This is the biggest experiment uh, in the history of this planet. It will require all of our creativity, and that means it will require us to bring some of our uncertainty out in front of us. We have to share some of our uncertainty so that other minds can participate in working collaboratively on that. So this is just a long way of saying that, that the relationship between the inside of the school and the outside of the school must change in order that we can help reduce stupidity about the evolution of, uh, 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 of, of cities. So you are all gathered here for what is basically an academic uh, conference about infrastructure. Yes, it's an alumni event, couldn't be better, but you come as experts, not as victims of the school. Right? And you come to, uh, in a way, 
uh, uh, let us realize what, is the, what are the dimensions of the field right now? What, is, what are the dimensions of the issue? What are the great uh, uh, opportunity? Um, we have uh, graduates here from 1954 all the way to last year. Um, truth in advertising, I was born in 1956. Um, just to give you the sense of um, how irrelevant my, my speech to you is. Um, I, I couldn't be more uh, honored than, than uh, to be here. It's a, a, a shocking and embarrassing privilege to be working with students that choose a school that embraces uncertainty. They, they know that this school says we are working on what might be happening 10 years from now. We need you to be a little bit like a researcher. We'll give you all of your professional skills, but we actually need you to be experimenting with us. Students that choose that, and they do that for all of our programs, versus a school that says, we've got the answers, we'll, you just have to download, and then repeat, broadcast what we tell you, and you're gonna get a job according to today's professional norms. Our students say, hey, that's great, I could, I, uh, I could get a job right away, but that's gonna be no good five years from now, when the whole concept of what it means to be a professional has evolved. So for us who teach here, no, nothing could be more um, uh, tender than the relationship between the teachers and the students, and no greater could the level of trust on the students be in us. And as a result, I think it's a very, very um, uh, beautiful place to be. Some of so you come here as victims of the school. Some of the current victimizers are in the room. They are marked with blue badges. So if you if you see a blue badge, understood this is somebody that's terrorizing students on a daily basis, otherwise known as a teacher, um, feel free to uh, introduce yourself and uh, uh, reprimand them um, for not taking good, good enough care of your fellow alumni uh, 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 to be. And I'm saying all of this, I'm saying this almost, I think, as a sort of a last speech in a sense because um, What's super important is we started organizing these alumni events three or four years ago precisely because we wanted to have this intellectual uh, kinship and networking and thinking together with the extended alumni community. But now it will reverse, and I'm really pleased about that. With the formation of the, of the Alumni Association, all such events like this will always be completely spearheaded by the Alumni Association, and we will be the support group. In other words, each year the alums will decide what are the important issues, what should be talked about, what kind of alcohol should be drunk, all these kind of crucial uh, uh, issues. By the way, uh, I recommend bad wine. Um, uh, I believe it could be scientifically demonstrated that the best ideas in architecture and planning and so on come from a combination of extremely good coffee uh, and extremely bad wine. Um, and if the coffee is not good, it's, uh, I'm sorry, things don't work out, and if the wine is really good, you do end the evening with a very nice discussion about you know, important issues, uh, a life, philosophy, pleasure, and so on, but no work is done. Um, so somehow conversation is liberated by, by the body, of course. Right? So of course alums will dictate how we would do that. And I really want to thank uh, Sharon Leibovitz, who maybe should stand up, because you know her, of course. She's the real force that's guiding the Alumni Association. She's recovering from the trauma of graduating from the MARC program in 1991, I think it is. Um, and it's just everybody's in admiration for what she's doing. And I think um, if any of you have ideas about what, you know, what could happen next with the Alum Association and so on, please uh, uh, talk with Sharon. Um, the, the, that association gets a lot of support from us, but in particular, you probably know already uh, uh, Lindsay Lawrence. Is she, can you wave up there? So again, if, if Sharon doesn't listen to you, uh, talk to Lindsay, and Lindsay will call Sharon. Um, but basically, Lindsay's only job is to take care of the alumni needs, um, and no matter what they are. And what I'm saying to you is we don't know what they are. In other words, you have to say what it is that you would like uh, us to help you uh, to do. Um, by the way, by being alumni, you're automatically members of this group. Um, it's not like those old things where they, you get you know, what they used to call LPs, three LPs, and then you have to pay for the rest. There's no, um, uh, you know, fees or anything. You, you are, by virtue of being alums, members of the Alumni Association, and you have all the rights uh, and responsibilities going there. There will be, a, no doubt, amazingly great parties, and that would be reason enough uh, to enjoy this. But there, there, of course, will be site visits, and, and you can always get involved in various committees and so on. I'm in, I'm in, in Beirut in a couple of weeks, and there, there are something like 20 alums 
in the city who would just would be dying to set up a tour um, for any of the alums that would like to visit and maybe we could do the same in Rio and Mumbai and, and all of these other places and I think it just could be a very nice way that you could um, enjoy the fact that we now have all sorts of networked contacts all over the world. Um, anyway, I think it's a great moment for the alum, alums to be sort of galvanizing uh, uh, a, a, as a group and um, it's not by accident as I'm saying that this, co this corresponds with the, with the radical change in the school. Uh, as you may know, um, we have not only now the, pro the programs, the six main programs of, uh, uh, that you're aware of, but then there are all the laboratories which go across programs dealing with questions of uh, ecology or networks or visualization or information or social justice or knowledge uh, and so on. We also have a series of initiatives that go between schools, so we would now work basically daily with the engineering school, with the School of Public Health, with the School of International Public Affairs, with the School of the Arts. Can you believe that for the first time this year a group of architecture students and their professor are collaborating with a group of artists and their professor, the great uh, uh, Liam Gillick, uh, and they're working together to make a pavilion that will be constructed uh, here on the campus as actually a public toilet. Um, they make the argument that a society that doesn't provide public toilets, doesn't really have the right to support art, so therefore they have, to, <laughs> they have to make a kind of project which is an artwork and an architectural work, and it's a public bathroom uh, on campus, so they're currently negotiating with um, a number of city agencies about how that will work. Um, but it, it, you would say to yourself, how come that never happened before? How come that architects who always think of themselves as artists and learn from artists never got together with architects and by the, with artists and you know it's almost impossible to be an artist today without your architectural portfolio and you're thinking about architecture because of this issue what is the future of cities this is not just an issue from an architecture school this is an issue for art schools for law schools for medical schools for public health for social welfare for journalism for everything for brain research so basically maybe what's changed since you were at the school is the entire university now thinks of itself as thinking about the questions of cities this means the university has to get outside of New York because New York is a magnificent place. Actually, it's a role model for cosmopolitan living. It's actually a role model for uh, uh, e ecology and many, many other, other things. Uh, 200 languages on the street, it's a role model for what it means to be a global citizen. But it is an old technology. I mean, it is not uh, 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 the laboratory city that it was in, 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 in one time. It remains the media network city the real laboratories, of course, are in the Middle East, are in uh, 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 East Asia, South Asia, Latin America, Africa, what used to be Russia. These are the places in which the uh, cities are evolving at a speed we've never seen. So this school now has research bases um, uh, in Beijing. We have a beautiful space near Forbidden City. It's a very large uh, space. In Mumbai, we have the most beautiful uh, uh, loft uh, space, a studio X in Mumbai, ne very in, again in the historic uh, uh, end of the peninsula near Victoria Terminal. In Rio, we have an exquisite building which is four meters wide by 75 meters long and 35 meters tall. It's like a flat iron building uh, directly onto one of the historic uh, uh, plazas of Rio. In fact, it's the plaza in which the constitution was signed and all the announcements used to be uh, made. It has a beautiful gallery. It has an astonishingly good $15,000 espresso machine uh, to guarantee the quality of uh, thinking. Um, we have a problem that the alcohol is really f of such a high quality, and we're, we're going to try to lower that uh, in the evening. But it's an amazing space. Likewise, in Amman, we are uh, inside a global center uh, in Amman, and we're also restoring the first prime minister's house of Jordan, which is in the very historic heart of Amman. And, and the city of Amman is, is, has been so touched by the fact that our students and faculty have been doing this that they have actually given us that building. So they, th they think we should take care of the legacy of this place. So that would be the Studio X in Amman. Um, why is that a big deal? Um, two years ago, the oldest street in human civilization was found half a kilometer from where that house is. That is to say, it, it's Neolithic. It makes Jericho look like a spring chicken. Um, this is, uh, um, uh, Amman is where cities were born and where, let's say, all of the uh, 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 conflict has passed through, but all the tenderness of the world somehow 
at least for now, remains. So we're very, very humbled uh, to be in Amman. We are developing our space in, in Moscow. And of course, we have one in downtown New York because this project is radically anti-colonial. This is not about Starbucks. This is not about bad coffee, by the way, uh, uh, sold around the world. This is really about us being students of the world and participating through the next 100 years or so in the evolving discourse. Of course, these spaces are meant to be uh, available to anyone, especially alums, to do with whatever you like, but we don't really care which school you're coming from, which discipline. If you have an interest in the future of cities, these spaces belong to you. In the, in the morning and the day, they are research spaces where people are working on books and exhibitions and research projects and studios and so on. And in the night, it's a salon where people are vibrantly discussing the future. The primary audience for these uh, uh, spaces is um, you know, people just are people like 25 to 35, 40. That is to say, I'm sorry to say, uh, you know, between graduation and vegetation. Right? And I apologize to all of us who are over 40. Um, but it's the group of people who left school are starting to become leaders in the professional environment, but still have the open aspirations, still feel themselves to be students and need to get together in the evenings and argue about what might be the right thing to do before they have become so uh, militarily focused on a particular skill set. So, for example, in Beijing, this means 400 young people turn up uh, every second evening or so to talk about this or, or that. Uh, um, about 150 now come to Mumbai events. Uh, Rio, we lose count. The whole building fills up. It's around about 200 people show up. Uh, New York's the same. We don't know where these people come from, how they find out about it. We never advertise. It's something to do with cell phones and tweets and all of that. But they're basically riding a vibrant uh, 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 e energy level. Now, all of those qualities are qualities that you probably remember from your time in the school. And what I'm saying is, and I'm going to finish with this, is that, of course, the great secret of a school is the studio space. And we are unique here that we have every program of the built environment. So it's not just architecture, it's, you know, it's urban planning, it's urban design, it's preservation, it's real estate development, it's all of these fields. And, and in a way, all of them, we, in all of those programs we teach design. Um, not only, for example, are the real estate developers doing design, but they now do design together with the architecture students and travel and they present, one side presents the business plan and the other presents the design and actually we no longer can figure out which one is which. Uh, for many of you, this is the strangest uh, 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 turn of events. Can you imagine that preservation and real estate are now in this kind of rich, exciting dialogue? I mean, these are sworn enemies. These are blood enemies. These are species that can smell each other uh, across one side of a city or another. A developer can smell four or five developers uh, 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 in, in the neighborhood and four or five preservationists. These are now uh, uh, intellectuals collaborating and thinking how could they uh, operate uh, uh, in, in a better way. If you're a preservationist and you don't understand real estate development, you're an idiot. You really are. And if you're a developer and you don't fully understand the arguments that preservationists are using and what part of society is being represented by that, then you're an idiot. And this is not a school for idiots. So now they all get together uh, 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 and talk. This school is a stupidity reduction machine, <laughs> right? That's its job. And, and as a result, you're, you will find here unbelievable new combinations of uh, of expertise. Anyway, um, all of this, by the way, will culminate in, a, in our biggest project yet, which is, in, which is going to be a new global center of global design and development, which will be a sort of uh, a, a space outside the walls of the university, a major conference facility and research center that will enable us to host all of the different parts of the university on the question, what is the future of cities? Um, but also invite all um, uh, people in New York that have any interest in that, but also all around the world, to actually try to produce the leading reports, the kind of key uh, white papers on the ba major issues facing global cities. So in other words, now that we have this deterritorialized de network, where we are genuinely partners with people around the world, we'll actually have a space here where the highest level of thinking is expected to happen. This will be the flagship of this school, but will also be the flagship of the university. It's a very big, very expensive proposition. It's going really, really uh, uh, well. I consider all of this to be just a minimum, a minimum that would at least enable universities to, to, to have a shot at helping discuss the future of cities. Uh, I think 
uh, all of us severely underestimate how difficult it is to imagine what the city of the future will be. I mean, when, when, we, when, when the state said it wanted to get to the moon because the Russians seemed to be getting ahead faster, we knew more or less what we were going towards. There's no oxygen uh, and it's all dusty. So we, we sent a bunch of guys to stand there and confirm that it was dusty and that there was no oxygen. And it required massive uh, social and intellectual resources to, to accomplish that. I think what is the city of 25 years from now might be a more radical proposition. We know less about what the city of the future might be than we know about the moon. We are moving towards it at the same speed and there's a hell of a lot more people involved and there's no real evidence that we've got any understanding of how that uh, might work. So all that I'm describing about the school here, you might say, why are we doing so much? I would say this is very little in the face of that issue and this school has a leadership role. We, we have to say, um, not like this is a tricky problem we have to say okay now let's let's put our creativity to to work here so i'm i've kind of inviting the alums to join in anyway the theme of infrastructure couldn't be more important uh, i'm not going to say anything about it because the, the whole purpose is to listen to the visiting uh, speakers uh, but you've got to know that infrastructure is becoming a huge issue for this school uh, again anybody that uh, any page written in this school that doesn't in some, at some point touch the question of infrastructure might not be a valuable page to write. Uh, if infrastructure is, let's say, uh, that which makes things possible in the same way that we think of the structure of a building as that which makes it possible for the building to stand, that which comes before, that, that which is there before what you experience, then anybody interested in the future of the cities is interested has to be interested in the infrastructure that allows the city to be a city. Uh, so, so you've picked a theme today which is massive. You have a great keynote speaker, uh, another victim of the school um, from the year 2000. So he's going through the 10-year uh, checkup uh, to see how the wounds are starting to heal a little bit. Um, Amanda Burden, uh, the, uh, the commissioner of, of, of city planning uh, for this city, also herself a victim of the very same program years before, I think in November announced uh, that Howard was, was, was assuming this incredibly important position in city government here in New York, which I think is a compliment to Howard, but also an amazing compliment to New York City that had ident identified that in this moment in time, such a position needed to be made, which is the director of sustainability and deputy director of strategic planning for New York City uh, Department of City Planning. He has been already uh, directing and continues to do, directing uh, basically all of the city's green initiatives uh, and promoting all, all uh, aspects of energy efficiency and intelligence, sustainable transportation, stormwater management, climate resilience, you, you name it. Um, trying not to be stupid about what New York will do. And there's a symmetry there between our desperate attempt to reduce stupidity and, and a city government that's trying to move forward in this, in this regard. He's been personally involved in guiding uh, like over a hundred regional rezonings in the last nine years, also supervising all sorts of aspects of waterfront planning and development, inclusion rezoning. If I were to tell you what he's been doing over the last 10 years, you would not consider him to be a human being. Um, um, and this remains in doubt. Uh, it's an astonishing level of, uh, uh, of commitment. I think it's a remarkable person doing remarkable things uh, on a very big scale, uh, overseeing um, uh, green projects uh, throughout the city in every neighborhood and, and at every scale. And I, I, I don't know how his age, so I can't tell you whether he's still in the zone between graduation and uh, vegetation, um, but I can tell you he's not vegetating and it's great that he's here. Thank you, uh, Dean Wigley. It's going to be very hard to uh, deliver after an introduction like that. I um, hope to live up to the uh, high standards that, uh, that, that this uh, school continues to maintain, for not only for intellectual discourse, but for sleeplessness, bad wine, and I think stupidity reduction. Um, I, I, I definitely hope that I, this presentation lives up to that today. Uh, I'm very happy to be back here in Wood Auditorium, actually, after all this time. I think the last time I was standing up uh, was uh, 
presenting uh, a studio project uh, back in something like 1999, and I uh, nonetheless remain optimistic about how things are going to go today. Um, and, and hope no one is really lying in wait with points from back then that I haven't delivered on. The, um, uh, after coming out of the program uh, here, I uh, went directly, actually had the good fortune to land at the Department of City Planning uh, in 2000 at a time when there was just so much dynamic, exciting, uh, and, and vibrant planning work going on and just really getting started. Um, in that experience with the city, I've had the privilege of working with uh, a wide range of, of really amazing uh, professionals, uh, many of whom went to this program and many of whom are actually here today, um, but a range of, of planners, architects, designers uh, at city planning and, and the public and private sectors who really added so much to this. I mean, everything I'm going to present here is really a product of not just my work, the work of others at uh, the Department of City Planning and city agencies, but really the, the collective work of a lot of, of New York City. Um, to talk about the theme of, of smart infrastructure, I'm really going to approach this. This is going to be a planner's presentation. Um, so I apologize for the, all the charts uh, up front. But uh, I'm going to really be looking at this through the lens of New York City and through the lens of what city government uh, has been doing uh, in recent years on particularly land use uh, and sustainability. Starting with the, the word infrastructure, it's of course, as, as Dean Libby pointed out, this sort of fundamental uh, underlying organizing logic of, of, of our cities. Um, but the term has really evolved over time. It's a term that used to refer primarily to large scale public works, bridges, dams, water supply systems. And now, over the years, has really become uh, a more flexible term and used to refer to a variety of different things. We don't have just you know, transportation infrastructure and water supply infrastructure. We have communications and information infrastructure. Some of that is physical infrastructure. Some of that is virtual infrastructure. We have institutional infrastructure. Uh, we have social infrastructure. All these things that are the, 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 the precondition for the functioning of our cities and, and human settlements. You know, a bridge, the Bayonne Bridge, isn't just a structure, uh, but it's part of a system. And I think that that's one of the, the fundamental things I'd like to use the term for today to really focus us on the systems that, that underlie um, our city. And then the idea of smart infrastructure uh, is something that we could look at narrowly. There certainly is technology that's changing what our infrastructure is. Uh, just examples are the uh, walk past just about any building in, in New York City, and you'll see a, a new uh, DEP water meter on the outside, which uh, no longer does somebody have to ring your doorbell early in the morning to uh, come and read your water meter, uh, but they can actually read it wirelessly. And not only is that a convenience and it saves money, uh, but it also provides this incredibly rich stream of data to uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, which can essentially measure water usage on a very granular basis, on an hourly basis. It enables them to find out whose uh, water mains, or, or, or whose pipes are leaking, essentially. If you're using a lot of water at 3 in the morning, you'll get a phone call from DEP uh, suggesting that you should probably look into this. There's, there's technology that, that acts as smart infrastructure, but I want to frame this issue a little bit more broadly and, and think of it as how can we be smart about our infrastructure? Maybe, actually I should frame it differently, how can we not be stupid about our infrastructure? We can aim high and, 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 and think about being smart about it. What does that mean? How do we make smart investments in infrastructure? How do we engage in smart management of our infrastructure and smart design? Um, and in, by smart, I think in many respects, I'm, I mean efficient, uh, cost effective, space efficient. Uh, certainly in New York City, we have so little space to spare. Uh, less wasteful of natural resources and non-renewable resources. Uh, smart growth, for instance, I think you could describe as essentially smart use of our infrastructure. Um, Today I'm going to talk about several of the ways that New York City is, is working to plan smarter, smartly uh, for and around our infrastructure. And I hope to also be pointing out not just some of the planning issues, but some of the challenges and opportunities that are, exist for design uh, with relation to these issues as well. The idea of broadening the concept here. So we all know New York City is built on a foundation of far-sighted infrastructural investments that date back to the 19th century and some even earlier uh, that provide the, the, the fundamental groundwork for the city's efficiency today. 
the Croton water system, uh, which uh, opened in 1842, uh, gave the city access to a clean, reliable water supply for the first time. It's a gravity-fed system, so unlike other parts of the country, we're not spending an uh, enormous share of our energy budget on pumping water. Uh, but this delivers water from the Croton Dam upstate, uh, continues to function today. It was built for about $11.5 million. Uh, it's paid for itself certainly many times over uh, and helped really fuel the, the water needs of a growing city. It was supplemented later by two additional and even larger uh, systems, the Catskill and the Delaware water systems, uh, both of which were ultimately completed by uh, mid-century. And then, of course, we have our subway. Uh, the construction of the uh, IRT uh, system began just a few years after the uh, consolidation of New York City in 1898 when the five boroughs were uh, unified. And the uh, system was built to very near what it, uh, the extent of it as it is today within uh, less than 40 years. Uh, the subway system very quickly became the backbone of the city's development. And this is more than a coincidence. Uh, the nation's first zoning resolution in 1916 was really designed around the nation's first and still its largest uh, mass transit system, recognizing that this was the uh, fundamental organizing logic of, of where populations, where businesses could be located around the city. Today, when we talk about transit-oriented development and smart use of our transportation infrastructure, we think of the subway as the thing that enables us to live in, in very dense patterns. Well, this is certainly true, but uh, back when the subway was built, it also had something of the opposite be set of benefits as well. In 1910, you see here uh, the, let me make sure I can use my pointer. Where's my, there we go. Uh, the city had a, a population uh, of about 4.7, 4.8 million in 1910. 2.3 million of them living in Manhattan uh, as compared to today when we have about you know, just under 1.6. Manhattan was by any measure overcrowded. There were over half a million people on the Lower East Side and that's about uh, 10 or 15 more than are on Ludlow Street on any given Saturday night, I think. The, uh, the population was very heavily overcrowded, as you can see uh, in the darkest colors here. And one of the things that the subway did is allowed that population to disperse to the other parts of the city, to the other parts of uh, the, the boroughs to which the subway system connected. The densities of which New York uh, existed in 2000 are still, by any measure, uh, in the United States, high densities. But it allowed the distribution of the population uh, in a dense settlement pattern uh, that uh, uh, relieved the overcrowded situation, the overcrowded conditions of, of Manhattan at the time, and enabled uh, cluster development uh, throughout the boroughs. It extended the areas from which this, along with actually other infrastructure improvements that I'm glossing over here, the construction of bridges, tunnels for road and rail throughout the region, helped connect the growing central business district to a, a, a growing regional workforce as well. These infrastructure improvements fueled the rapid growth of the city during the early part of the uh, 20th century, as you can see, it grew to very nearly 8 million by 1950, uh, at which time uh, in the middle of the century, uh, as with other cities around the country, uh, rapid suburbanization uh, was drawing populations out of uh, the centers of cities. Uh, that growth leveled off, and then in the 1970s, uh, amidst a fiscal crisis, uh, declining quality of life and decaying infrastructure, the city lost nearly a million residents uh, during that decade. Uh, through a focused and determined effort uh, in the decades that have followed, the city has rehabilitated uh, its infrastructure and uh, once again, beginning in the 1980s, population resumed growing, uh, reached record uh, a population of over eight million in 2000, has continued to grow since then investment uh, in our infrastructure and the quality of life in New York City are a tremendous part of that. These were uh, key elements recognized in Plan YC, which uh, Mayor Bloomberg uh, introduced uh, in 2007. Uh, this is a plan that looked at the long-term sustainability of New York City, uh, looking at our projected growth in the future and recognizing that in order to accommodate this growth, we really had to think hard and think smart about our infrastructure. The plan identified Q2 
key investments to expand our infrastructure, ideas for ways to finance that infrastructure, as well as ideas for how we can better manage the infrastructure that we do have. Plan YC also identified uh, another, or really added to the, the policy discourse, uh, another element that really uh, is, is critical here, and I want to dwell on for a few minutes as the uh, representative of the, the, the Director of Sustainability for uh, the City Planning Department focused for a moment on um, greenhouse gas emissions. The plan, uh, Plan YC, uh, really uh, heightened awareness of our greenhouse gas emissions and identified specific targets for reducing those, uh, a decrease of 30% uh, of by the year 2030. By now we're all here familiar with the severity and the, the urgency of, of the issue of, of global climate change and the importance of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, one thing that we learned from Plan YC and from the efforts that uh, it, it, it uh, uh, initiated was that in, in by some measures we're actually doing incredibly well and it's because of our infrastructure. Uh, this chart shows New York City's per capita carbon emissions, 5.9 metric tons uh, per capita uh, of carbon emissions uh, from New York City uh, residents. Uh, those compare to uh, very favorably to other cities in the United States. We uh, have less than one third the uh, per capita emissions of the national average and also compare favorably to cities around the world uh, including, uh, well, first of all, uh, cities around the United States. The next lowest as of the 2009 inventory was Seattle at 8.1. Um, but other cities, uh, Stockholm, uh, winning the competition so far at 3.4. But uh, cities around the world, you'll, you'll notice that there's a pattern here. These are dense cities that rely on uh, uh, public transportation uh, heavily. And also, uh, another factor here is also the, the, the primary energy sources, uh, the primary means through which these uh, different cities generate their energy. But the item I'd like to focus on here is really the, the transportation land use match and the significance of that to New York City's performance. Uh, the built environment, the match between our, our physical infrastructure and our settlement patterns uh, is the reason why we have a 55% public transportation uh, journey to work shares of the most recent American Community Survey. Uh, only 29% of New Yorkers travel to work by automobile. Uh, a full 10% walk to work. In many ways, it's not new technology, but it's old technology and old time-tested infrastructure ideas that have better equipped us to deal with this most urgent of challenges for the future. I like to uh, say about uh, transit-oriented development in New York City, it, it's kind of like uh, Chinese food in China, they just call it food, we just call it development. Um, other cities uh, around the United States in particular uh, struggle to try to cultivate the conditions that will result in transit-oriented development in New York City. We're fortunate enough to have this uh, long and demonstrated uh, pattern and, and tradition and, and, and culture of transit-oriented not only development but living. People understand that this is a place that they want to be and want to live. These are two images from the, both from the outskirts of uh, downtowns in Lower Manhattan and in, in Houston that just illustrate the, the differences between uh, dense development or de between development uh, in an environment that's built on a robust transit network uh, and one that is not. Um, transit infrastructure and density are, are clearly interdependent. You need one for the other. Without the density, you don't get the ridership that you need in order to financially support the transit system. Um, and without transit, it's difficult to achieve real density. For one thing, you have to figure out where to put all the cars. Um, I use Manhattan as an example, but this logic really extends outside of Manhattan to other parts of the city as well. Transit-oriented development um, has real tangible effects for the rest of the city. This parade of pie charts is from a study that the, the city planning uh, did based on 2000 census data and looked at transportation in the boroughs outside Manhattan. Uh, and we uh, looked in particular here at what the mode shares were for uh, different neighborhoods, uh, particularly neighborhoods that are close to the Manhattan core, but uh, and better served by transit. And in those neighborhoods you see highlighted in red, you get this very small uh, automobile share of uh, a quarter or roughly a quarter um, for all these neighborhoods. And in these neighborhoods people rely instead to get to work on subway, uh, bus, 
and then a large share on other, which includes walking, bicycling, uh, working at home. Uh, the combination of, of good uh, alternatives to the automobile and uh, high density and mixes of use really provide uh, a much more, uh, a, a more sustainable framework for the growth of neighborhoods. And this translates really directly into lower energy consumption and lower greenhouse gas emissions. This is a, uh, an analysis from a, a report prepared by Jonathan Rose Companies uh, under an EPA grant. And it just illustrates, based on a set of general assumptions, um, a comparison between conventional suburban developments uh, in a, sort of a lower density context where uh, automobiles are more necessary for a wide range of trips, and transit-oriented development in a denser, more urban environment where destinations are available by transit or walking or other means. Um, building in a, a, a set of assumptions about uh, what a typical uh, development might be that uh, is an, an ordinary development or, say, a green building that incorporates energy star features, uh, or ordinary uh, automobiles uh, as opposed to um, uh, fuel-efficient uh, automobiles. There's a comparison here that, that shows that not only are is multifamily housing more energy efficient than single-family attached housing, than single-family detached housing, but even more striking is that uh, within each of these categories, even a ungreen building with ungreen automobiles uh, is greener uh, when it's located in an urban context than when it's lo located in a suburban context. A very highly energy efficient building uh, in, in an environment where you have to come and go by automobile ultimately has real costs in terms of uh, energy consumption and, and greenhouse gas emissions. To appropriate a phrase from uh, the real estate industry, it's location, 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 right? Uh, how important is this in terms of magnitude? Well, uh, looking at New York City's uh, population growth, estimated growth between 2000 and 2009, the city grew by about 383,000 in population during this nine-year period. That's actually uh, about the size of the city of Minneapolis. If you were to take those 383,000 people and sprinkle them uh, all over the United States and have them emit greenhouse gas emissions at the national average rate, which we showed on the, our earlier slide, they would emit a total of 7.3 million metric tons of, of carbon dioxide equivalents. Um, at the New York City average, this group uh, emits just 2.3 million metric tons, uh, a difference, of course, of five. The significance of this, though, what is five million metric tons of carbon dioxide? It's the equivalent of the annual emissions of 985,000 cars driven for the average roughly 12,000 miles uh, that those are driven annually in the United States. Uh, and what is 985,000 cars? Well, it's a lot more cars than enter uh, the New York City, enter Manhattan's uh, central business district on a typical weekday. It's about 25% more, or about 33% more. This immense difference that are, are, are paying attention to infrastructure, paying attention to our, to our transportation, uh, our transit-oriented uh, uh, growth patterns, uh, really emphasizes uh, the department's philosophy on how uh, our growth should occur. We really have to cultivate uh, compact, transit-oriented development, walkable, bikeable, mixed-use neighborhoods, and making sure that these are places that people want to live, because uh, ultimately, people choose where they want to live, and uh, when they choose to live in these kinds of environments, it really benefits us all from an environmental perspective. Historically, as I mentioned, uh, the city's growth spread throughout the boroughs uh, from the transit system, but uh, after mid-century, uh, and actually after the 1970s in particular, that pattern dispersed somewhat. You can see that between 1970 and 2000, the proportion of uh, housing in the city that's within a half a mile of, uh, of public transit actually declined somewhat. Uh, in recent years, the, the, the past decade roughly, this, the, the Department of City Planning and the city's land use policies have focused on channeling our potential for growth back toward transit. Um, and to that end, we've, uh, under the leadership of uh, Amanda Burden, have completed 109 uh, rezonings uh, of neighborhoods throughout the city that have focused on channeling growth towards transit, increasing the potential for uh, developments in transit-served neighborhoods while limiting the potential for growth in auto-dependent neighborhoods. 
uh, where uh, there are few alternatives to the automobile. Uh, and as a result of those rezonings in part, and as a result of the response of the marketplace, we've really seen that this dynamic has turned around. The housing boom that we are all aware uh, recently ended, um, but that housing boom, uh, while it was going on, was really essentially a transit-oriented development boom in New York City. The upper line on this uh, slide shows housing production, the number of units created every year, uh, permitted every year, within a half a mile of transit. And then the lower line in red is the units that are more than a half mile from transit. They remained relatively flat throughout the, the boom, but really the growth uh, occurred in those locations that are well served by transit. Between 2007 and 2010, we've been tracking this as part of Plan YC, 87% of our new housing permits have been located within a half mile of transit. This is really just an astonishing figure when you compare it to uh, other locations. This shift from peripherally oriented development towards centralized or central development in central areas has also occurred on a regional level. Uh, this is a, a, a graphic showing the uh, regional housing production in uh, New York City in red uh, and the rest of the region in blue. At the same time that New York City's uh, housing development was trending towards uh, locations near transit. It was also capturing a, an increasingly large share of, of new housing production within the region. And a focus on transit-oriented development is not something that's limited to New York City. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, I, I was uh, happy to uh, be in attendance at the kickoff of a new uh, multi-jurisdictional bi-state collaboration called New York uh, Connecticut Sustainable Communities. Uh, which, with the support of a $3.5 million grant from uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development through their Sustainable Communities Regional Planning Grant Program, is uh, focusing on regional uh, planning and, and local implementation of, of regional planning goals to promote transit-oriented development at centers throughout the region, recognizing that the more we can channel population and job growth toward these centers, the better connected we all are to one another. Uh, this is a collaboration that involves uh, nine cities, four metropolitan planning organizations, two county governments, uh, and two regional planning organizations, uh, as well as the partnership with a, a variety of state agencies and certainly the federal government. Um, New York City is very proud to be a, a, an active participant in, in this partnership. So I'd like to take a, a, a few minutes to talk about some several case studies of, of major city planning rezoning initiatives and how they approached uh, opportunities to match land use and infrastructure, um, particularly transportation infrastructure, uh, in a variety of different ways. Here in downtown Brooklyn, uh, we had the city's third largest business district uh, with extraordinary transit access served by many subway lines, served by the Long Island Railroad, but also lacking uh, in uh, activity, a 24-hour activity, and with restrictive zoning and uh, substantial amounts of underutilized land within the downtown area itself. The Downtown Brooklyn Plan, which was produced jointly by uh, City Planning and the City's Economic Development Corporation, uh, saw the potential here for a multi-use uh, urban environment that serves not only residences, businesses, academic institutions, cultural institutions, uh, to really reactivate Downtown Brooklyn and, and, and improve uh, not only the neighborhood but also the surrounding communities, uh, invigorating this as a, a real 24-hour neighborhood. By replacing restrictive zoning with districts that allowed high density, uh, as of right, residential and office development. The plan really opened the door for downtown Brooklyn to emerge as a vibrant mixed use center. Um, the plan also paid careful attention to the urban design challenges of how to grow uh, uh, this kind of high density downtown while preserving and strengthening the uh, adjacent historic neighborhoods around its edges. Permitted density centered here around the uh, transit hubs and transitions down to the edges of the neighborhood. Uh, where the surrounding neighborhoods are stable, low-rise residential communities. Th uh, specifically, tailored height and setback rules here were established in order to address Flatbush Avenue uh, as a dynamic and exciting boulevard and help turn it from uh, essentially a barrier, uh, a multi-lane thoroughfare that separated uh, two portions of the neighborhood and turn and really transform it into a, a boulevard. Um, there's also particular attention given to the improvements of the uh, J Street uh, Transit Center, now the J Street Metro Tech uh, Station as well as streetscape improvements, uh, and it's also spawned additional efforts to improve uh, streetscape and the uh, retail environment of the Fulton Mall and other parts of the downtown area. So in, in downtown Brooklyn, it was really a matter of taking the infrastructure that was in place and, 
and, and, and making the best use of it. In Hudson Yards, uh, we had a very different situation. We had infrastructure in place. The uh, camera rail yards uh, shown here at the bottom of the picture are clearly an important piece of regional infrastructure, but uh, the way they existed uh, limited the potential for uh, the, 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 the sites themselves and the neighborhood around them. Um, the relationship here between infrastructure and uh, development were somewhat different than uh, in, say, downtown Brooklyn. Before this project, there were basically no uh, remaining sites for a full floor plate office building left in midtown Manhattan. There was definitely uh, an evident need to find more room for the central business district to expand in order to help the city's economy and tax base grow. Uh, and on Midtown's doorstep sat these 59 blocks where uh, restrictive zoning didn't allow the construction of large commercial or residential buildings. Uh, the city planning looked comprehensively at this 59 block area and created a large, uh, complex, intricate rezoning uh, uh, and urban design master plan for the area. One of the main reasons that this area had seen little growth and development for the previous 40 years was a lack of transportation. The nearest subway was at uh, 8th Avenue uh, really more than a 10 minute walk away from much of the area, limiting the potential for high density mixed use development. The critical element here in this project was the extension of the number seven train, which currently terminates at Times Square, to 34th Street and 11th Avenue, to the Javits Center, to the uh, sites of the uh, Eastern and Western Rail Yards. The Hudson Yards plan identified not only the needed transit improvements, but also a mechanism that this could be, this and other infrastructure improvements could be funded uh, by taking the revenues uh, from future development and using them to leverage funding for $2 billion of new infrastructure, including the seven line extension, which is already uh, underway and is actually on time and on budget, as well as the uh, creation of uh, other infrastructure in the neighborhood, acquisition and creation of open space, the uh, Hudson uh, Boulevard and Park through the area as well. The plan adopted in 2005 provided for 24 million square feet of commercial space and over 13,000 units of mixed income housing along with a new street network and a new uh, network of, of open space land with Landscape Boulevard running through the new neighborhood. So in downtown Brooklyn, we had the infrastructure. In Hudson Yards, we had to create the infrastructure. In West Chelsea, we really had to reimagine the infrastructure. The High Line, uh, as everyone here I'm sure knows, was an abandoned railroad track that used to take uh, meat to the markets along the, uh, in the meatpacking district in West Chelsea, running for 22 blocks uh, from the Gansevoort Meat Market uh, through West Chelsea and up to the Hudson Yard site at uh, 34th Street. Uh, this is what the Highland looked like before the project. Uh, essentially, weeds, wild growth, had, had turned the elevated trestle into an accidental linear park, uh, linear garden in the sky. Um, with a hint of what the real potential was for this. At the same time, the structure itself was widely regarded as a blighting influence on the neighborhood and was slated for demolition. Advocates, most importantly, the uh, Friends of the High Line, uh, had the insight that the High Line had this immense potential to add value to the area and to really actually serve as the organizing principle for a new neighborhood. The department's planning for West Chelsea and the High Line, championed by our commissioner, uh, Amanda Burden, re envisioned the neighborhood with a High Line as the defining feature of the neighborhood, really taking a defunct piece of transportation infrastructure and turning it into the open space infrastructure that holds the neighborhood together both uh, functionally and aesthetically. And the mechanism by which uh, we accomplished that was by taking the, uh, the properties, the privately owned properties, uh, located under and, and, and near and above the High Line, and allowing those development rights to be transferred to receiving sites uh, on 10th and 11th Avenues, and uh, increasing the permitted heights for those, uh, those development sites if they purchase the development rights from the High Line. Uh, this type of mechanism, this transfer of development rights, created value not only for the owners of the parcels located under the High Line, but also for the surrounding districts and helped lead to the consensus that uh, achieved the approval of the zoning for the area, which ultimately led to the creation of the park designed by James Cornerfield Operations with uh, Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro. The park has probably been the single greatest instantaneous hit of, uh, uh, of, of New York City's uh, open space system. It's really known throughout the world as a premier destination uh, 
for the public, but it also spawned this incredible activity uh, in terms of development and architecture in the surrounding neighborhood. It really catalyzed a tremendous amount of private investment, over 34 development projects from the most distinguished architects uh, in the world, establishing West Chelsea as one of the most exciting neighborhoods in the city, if not the world, in terms of contemporary architecture. So those are just a few examples. Sometimes you have the infrastructure. Sometimes you need to provide it. Um, sometimes you have to figure out what else to do with it. There are places, certainly, where uh, infrastructure investment uh, is, is, is uh, widespread, is happening on an, incredibly, an incredible scale, for instance, in China, where uh, explosive urban growth and a tremendous investment in, 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 in those urban centers and the transportation within and between them uh, is being made in passenger rail in particular, uh, linking the incredibly uh, dynamic uh, new cities of China. Uh, anyone following the uh, debates or the news from Washington these days knows that uh, we have less of a consensus, shall we say, in the, uh, significant, the importance of uh, federal investments uh, in uh, infrastructure. Um, despite some of those challenging uh, circumstances, we are in New York City continuing to make uh, substantial investments in our infrastructure, including here, uh, the Second Avenue subway uh, under, under construction, uh, the uh, uh, portion above 63rd Street on the east side, uh, along with the extension of the 7 train to Hudson Yards, the east, east side access project, and other infrastructure projects. This is the third water tunnel uh, project that DEP is, uh, is building. This will add redundancy to the system and enable them to actually shut down and, and maintain the centuries-old Croton system and the other uh, elements of the, uh, 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 the water supply system in order to uh, make this, the water supply to the city much more uh, efficient and effective. So we are making trans, uh, sorry, uh, significant investments in our in infrastructure, but there are also clear limitations on our ability to expand our infrastructure. There are instances where, whether it's in the short run or the long run, whether it's for cost reasons, space limitations, or other reasons, we are not able to expand our infrastructure. How do we manage the infrastructure that we do have? Well. Traffic congestion is one of the most obvious instances of this, I think. Roadways fill up, uh, and congestion ends up costing the city uh, and, its, and its residents and businesses millions of dollars in, in delays and lost productivity every year. In 2007, as everyone, I'm sure, knows this New York City, the mayor proposed a uh, congestion pricing system that would have charged vehicles entering the uh, core of Manhattan uh, during peak hours uh, a, a, a particular fee, the revenues from that fee would have been directed towards improvements uh, in uh, transit. This proposal, of course, uh, was not supported by the state legislature, uh, did not move forward. Uh, but despite that outcome, it's important to keep in mind that pricing is one of the uh, important tools that's available for managing the capacity of our infrastructure. It's already in use, uh, both here and elsewhere. If you cross the George Washington Bridge at rush hour, you pay $8. If you cross at other times, you pay $6. Uh, there are high occupancy toll lanes on highways uh, emerging around the country. There, uh, the New York City Department of Transportation has uh, been experimenting with peak hour pricing uh, for parking meters in neighborhood retail streets so that uh, during peak hours when uh, it's most important, there can be higher uh, rates for parking, encouraging turnover, encouraging greater availability of parking for the customers of those businesses. These are all uh, types of innovations and opportunities that in large part have been made possible by technological improvements, uh, easy pass, license plate readers, the smart uh, parking meters, the muni meters that exist on, uh, on our streets now, uh, and other similar types of, of, of technologies. The storage of cars is another instance where you can see demand pressing up against the limits of our physical infrastructure. Uh, even with our mass transit system and our, and our walkable neighborhoods, simply by virtue of the amount of activity and the number of people we have here, we have uh, a number, of, a substantial number of cars that are stored in the city, uh, vehicles used by residents, workers, and businesses. Uh, there's no end of debate over uh, how to approach these sets of issues. But there are also uh, infrastructural uh, approaches that um, have been uh, pursued that are emerging, uh, really pioneered in large part from the private sector, um, and the nonprofit sectors in, in terms of new types of approaches and solutions to this. For instance, there are 
automated mechanical parking garages that can store uh, a, uh, an automobile using less space than is needed in a conventional parking facility. There are also other models that are, uh, have the potential to reduce the number of uh, vehicles that are needed in the first place in order to serve the population. Uh, one of them is uh, car sharing, which is an alternative to private vehicle ownership originated in Europe and has increasingly uh, uh, gained a foothold in the United States. Uh, New York City is really the nation's capital of car sharing with over a third, I believe, of the uh, national membership uh, in car sharing located here in New York City or in the New York City metropolitan area. In essence, car sharing is short-term on-demand uh, vehicle rental with cars available by the hour from uh, on a self-service basis. And here's a, a, a bit of a description as to what we think the potential for car sharing is. Uh, and if you think of the transportation infrastructures, including not just our transit system, our, our roadways and uh, parking spaces, but also the vehicle fleet itself and the tenure of the vehicle fleet, um, you can conceive of this as a smart infrastructure approach. Um, with a conventional vehicle, one or two people own the car, you know, share the car, use the car, park it in one parking space. Um, with car sharing, 40, 50 or more members share a single vehicle, which requires that same parking space. Uh, there are a range of studies that suggest that at various rates that some proportion of car share members uh, will give up a vehicle or postpone acquiring a vehicle, uh, which uh, means that of this 40 or so people, several of them won't have cars. Uh, and this would help ease the demand for parking spaces in the area. Um, this is one of the models by which uh, uh, car sharing, uh, we think, has the real potential to uh, help us deal with this, the space crunch for parking. It also changes the economics of how people use a car. When you own a car, um, you pay a lot for that car, uh, and you pay that either up front or on an ongoing basis uh, through your lease payments. Um, but essentially, the cost of using that car on, for, on an individual uh, basis is relatively small. It's the uh, cost of the fuel you use, it's the cost of perhaps parking, it's the cost of um, the hassle factor that you go through uh, of accessing the car, but really you have a large sunk cost uh, in, in, your, in your vehicle up front. With car sharing, the economics are somewhat different. You pay a relatively small membership fee and you pay for every hour or mile that you use the car and what this tends to do is in, it encourages people to think in advance about how they use the car to combine trips into linked trips uh, those trips, the multiple people using this, this same shared car are going to use it at different times of the day uh, based on however they uh, can essentially allocate their time. And this can help alleviate uh, sort of peak hour uh, congestion. It helps provide people with more alternatives to owning an automobile as well. There's other kinds of transportation infrastructure that are, of course, very important. Uh, bicycles. Uh, need room too, whether it's uh, on-street bike lanes for, uh, uh, for uh, within the, uh, the on-street transportation network uh, where DOT has very actively been expanding the uh, dedicated space for, for bicycles or the storage of bicycles. Bicycles need parking too. As a matter of fact, um, City Planning did a study uh, a few years ago that found that uh, th one of the most important reasons people cited for uh, not commuting to work by bicycle was that they didn't have a safe place to store their bicycle um, at the workplace in particular, or, or even at home. Uh, the number of uh, bicycles over the years that I've seen stored on people's balconies, I think, was a testament to this. Um, city planning, in recognition of this, uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, instituted new uh, zoning requirements that require bicycle parking, uh, secure enclosed bicycle parking in new buildings. Beyond transportation, of course, there's other important critical infrastructure in the city. Another um, key element is our energy infrastructure. Uh, whether it's the generation of infrastructure, uh, the generation of energy uh, within the city or outside the city or the transmission of the, of the energy throughout the city. Uh, we know what happens when these systems fail. Uh, this is actually a picture from the uh, 2003 blackout, which was not caused locally. It was it had a, essentially a regional um, cause. But there have been other instances, particularly, uh, I think, uh, in northwestern Queens in 2006, when our uh, distribution network for electricity was overtaxed. Uh, certainly, it, we know that it's important to continue to upgrade uh, and maintain our energy infrastructure, but there are also other strategies that we can use to um, ease the stress on the grid. Um, 
solar energy uh, generation offers one particular uh, set of advantages for that. It's not only a clean uh, source of energy and greenhouse gas free, but its peak supply complements perfectly the peak demand period uh, within uh, the city. Uh, on hot summer days, uh, where the uh, energy demand is at its peak, also uh, solar generation is at its peak. So uh, a collaboration uh, using a, uh, actually a U.S. Department of Energy grant, a collaboration between uh, city agencies, CUNY, uh, Con Edison, and a number of state agencies, they uh, created what are called the New York City Solar Empowerment Zones, where there's targeted uh, support and investment in solar power development in areas where it can really help uh, ease stress on the grid and help uh, prevent or postpone or prevent the need for further investments in the grid uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, give the system more robustness and, and, and actually prevent investments that are going to require uh, uh, increases in electricity rates. Our buildings are also a key part of our infrastructure and they uh, in addition to the supply side of energy, we also have to think very hard about the demand side. Uh, over three quarters of our greenhouse gas emissions in New York City come from our buildings and the lion's share of our energy consumption. Um, as part of Plan YC, there's been a strong focus on identifying means of improving the energy performance of our buildings, not just our new buildings, but our existing buildings, which are going to really represent 85% of the buildings we have in 2030. We need to really think of our buildings as infrastructure opportunities. Uh, whether it's for conserving energy through uh, improved insulation, uh, generating energy through solar or other means, um, reconceptualizing how we fuel our vehicle fleet um, by, uh, you know, essentially as electric vehicles enter the fleet, uh, we no longer conceptualize of a gas station as something you go to or, or a fueling station, but something that happens in the garage itself. Um, we can also use our buildings to help uh, manage stormwater in particular. There are all sorts of other things that we can conceive of as infrastructure that supports the vital functions and the thriving of our neighborhoods. Um, there are many, many elements, too many to list here, just a few. Housing, jobs, uh, local retail and services, uh, open space. These are all things that we have to think about in the planning of our neighborhoods. Uh, and we're continuing to seek new ways to address these in, in the planning uh, of our neighborhoods. City planning is, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things here. The inclusionary housing program is a program that's existed since 1987, but we expanded dramatically in 2005 to uh, help produce and preserve uh, affordable housing in neighborhoods that are experiencing substantial new development. Through this program, new developments are eligible for a density bonus of up to 33% uh, when they provide permanently affordable housing. Uh, since the expansion of this program in 2005, it's been applied to more than two dozen neighborhoods that have been rezoned to encourage new development. And the program has to date produced over 3,300 units of, of affordable housing, permanently affordable housing. Another innovative uh, example is our FRESH program, where uh, working with the Department of Health, we looked at neighborhoods that are food deserts, um, where residents lacked access to healthy, fresh food, certainly a key part of anything you would conceive of as our the infrastructure for healthy, sustainable neighborhoods. Um, neighborhoods where, because of that lack of, uh, of access to food, we had high levels of, uh, of public health uh, diet-related diseases, uh, such as uh, obesity and uh, diabetes. In these areas, uh, EDC and city planning together put together a, a package of financial and zoning incentives uh, to create uh, stores that offer a wide range of healthy, fresh foods. Uh, targeted to these areas of greatest need. There's just two more topics I'd like to, to try to touch on briefly. One of them is green infrastructure, and, and, and this is really um, something uh, It's important. In the, in the development of, of New York City in our highly urbanized form uh, over the years, we've replaced, obviously, natural systems by mechanical systems and, and hardscape um, and structure. And in the process, too often, I think we undervalued the natural services that are provided by uh, the systems that had existed there before. Street trees are probably the best example I can think of uh, of multifunctional infrastructure. Um, whoever designed them was clearly a genius. They are the most space efficient means of reducing the urban heat ion effect and also one of the most cost effective. They capture and retain stormwater. They can reduce local flooding and runoff, prevent combined sewer overflows that pollute our waterways. They provide aesthetic benefits, uh, beautify our streets and neighborhoods. Uh, and as part of the Million Trees New York City initiative, uh, city planning recently put into effect uh, zoning tax amendments that require the planting of street trees along the perimeter of, 
of new developments throughout the city. We also uh, put into place requirements for the landscaping uh, and uh, planting of trees throughout the uh, commercial and community facility parking lots, recognizing that these are areas that otherwise can easily turn into asphalt, uh, seas of asphalt, essentially, that, that uh, contribute to urban heat on effect and, and runoff problems. DEP, our uh, Department of Environmental Protection, uh, and its green infrastructure plan uh, really recognize the uh, potential of this kind of approach to infrastructure, which is really different from the traditional, what we call gray approach to infrastructure. Um, with gray infrastructure, investments are costly, take a, a long period of time, uh, and benefits are really realized uh, only at some point in the future and, and, uh, and are generally a, of one particular uh, type of benefit. You know, sewer pipes provide drainage functions, uh, for instance. Um, green infrastructure offers uh, not only flexibility but also the ability to uh, achieve a wider range of benefits. It can be deployed at, uh, in small increments over wide, wide areas, uh, realizing benefits immediately, uh, and with those benefits growing over time. Uh, DEP's uh, analysis of the potential for uh, infrastructure investments showed that there are cost-effective investments in traditional, uh, what they call gray infrastructure, that can be made. Uh, but then, beyond a certain point, those uh, further investments in, in pipes become less cost-effective. And instead, they're uh, working on substituting uh, investments in, in green infrastructure. This, this includes uh, items like this uh, stormwater tree pit you see here, uh, which is designed to uh, capture a substantial amount of the runoff from not only this uh, sidewalk, but also the adjacent area that drains to it. Um, these types of best management practices are being piloted uh, and further uh, developed throughout the city. Uh, everything from green street treatments to these tree pits to green roofs and blue roofs uh, that can help slow the flow of uh, stormwater into the city's sewer system and reduce uh, combined sewer outflows. Our waterfront um, is actually itself a, an important piece of infrastructure in some ways. It's the infrastructure that keeps the land there. Uh, this Waterfront infrastructure includes miles, uh, we have 520 miles of, of shoreline throughout New York City. Um, this includes miles of bulkheads, seawalls, riprap, and other types of stabilized shoreline as well as natural shorelines. Um, we have other types of facilities all along the waterfront, parkland, docks, ferry terminals, uh, port facilities, maritime and support services, uh, all of which uh, have this uh, type of uh, important waterfront infrastructure that, that supports the functioning of these uses as well as the uses that depend on them. Uh, today, those types of uh, infrastructure are already uh, at risk of uh, adverse effects from severe storms. And in the future, we know that climate change and sea level rise will increase these risks uh, and further test our infrastructure. We're gonna need to really continue to find ways, new and innovative ways, to improve our resilience, the city's ability to withstand and recover quickly from uh, adverse climate effects that are going to become more common in the future. There are no easy solutions to these issues uh, in New York City uh, or anywhere really, but there are certainly a wide, wide range of opportunities and the potential for design to uh, come up with new and innovative solutions. Uh, this is just one. This is perhaps most the mo the, one of the most mundane things, which is uh, a subway grade on Broadway where um, by elevating the subway grates in areas that are prone to flooding, we can prevent the flooding of the uh, sewer system itself. There are uh, a wide range of other things uh, that we are beginning to look at and we're going to continue to uh, explore. This is just an image from Brooklyn Bridge Park, the southern side of, uh, of Pier 1, where you can see constructed wetlands, uh, the soft edges that are, oops, I'm sorry, the soft edges that are, have been uh, deployed here and other design approaches that can help uh, produce multiple benefits uh, while protecting uh, the shoreline. Looking ahead to the future, the best available science projects that we have the potential for by the 2080s, 55, uh, up to 55 inches of sea level rise. Um, in areas perhaps other than New York City uh, that are less developed, retreat from settlements may be an option where you can move further inland, move to higher ground uh, in order to prevent uh, the risk that's associated with uh, uh, sea level rise and the potential for future storm surges. In New York City, it's much more challenging situation. We can't pick up our infrastructure and move it somewhere else. The uh, investments that enable us to live here in, in a way that actually contributes so much less 
to global climate change um, are fixed and we need to really start to think creatively about uh, ways that we can uh, adapt to the uh, changes that are going to be uh, occurring. This is a, a, an image from a, one of the remarkable projects we've seen um, on the Water Palisade Bay from uh, Guy Nordenson, Catherine Sievit, and Adam Urinsky that uh, actually served as a jumping off point for the recent Rising Currents exhibit at MoMA, which provided a forum for really exploring this uh, set of ideas in the future. We're going to really have to think creatively about how do we look at uh, living with the uh, more present threats of, of sea level rise and storm surge? How do we protect ourselves from maybe the force of storm surges, even if we can't protect ourselves from all flooding? On a related note, I think I'll, I'll leave with this thought. Uh, you know, we know that we need to continue to think broadly about what is infrastructure, what services and benefits it provides, and how we can invest in it. Um, oysters are uh, another one of those uh, genius inventions. They are perhaps the most efficient water filtration devices that we know of. Uh, they once existed in abundance in New York City's waterways. Is it possible that mollusks could be part of our infrastructure? How do we conceive of the contributions of all these varied and diverse elements as part of our functional infrastructure that support our city? Um, essentially, uh, the, the, what I've covered here is only like a corner of the picture, and I'm sure that the discussions, uh, the panels for the rest of the day are going to cover a lot more ground. I think the, the thought that I'd like to leave with is that we know there are a variety of ways uh, to think about infrastructure. The important thing is that we think about infrastructure. Thanks. If anyone has questions, I'll be happy to answer them. The city. And it seems to me that that's, I've, I've seen a lot of talks on infrastructure. And I'd like to think about how you at City Planning are considering the, the, the younger and the much older age demographic of the city. It's an, it's an excellent point. It's a sort of a continually evolving part of the dynamic of New York City. We have you know, everything from um, uh, large youth populations to naturally occurring retirement communities, right? Um, uh, parts of the city where we have large populations of seniors, parts of the city we have large populations of young people. And I know that. Um, the Department of Transportation, in particular, I think, has looked very closely at, at, at some of these issues, including uh, identifying priority uh, intersections and areas where you, there can be improvements for safety. Uh, for instance, uh, there's uh, safe streets for seniors. There are safe streets, safe routes to school programs. We are identifying uh, some of the most challenging intersections uh, for crossings, for instance, in order to um, uh, help. Uh, uh, improve safety, improve the way that those uh, uh, intersections function for the continually evolving population is important. Um, the, uh, uh, there are also, um, I think we project that the city's population is going to continue to age uh, into the future. Um, we are also constantly grappling with uh, uh, the emergence of school age populations, right? And the school construction authority uh, has has to keep up with uh, the creation of schools and districts as populations move from one part of the city to another. So it's really, uh, it's an important thing for us to continue to focus on. Uh, no, of course. There's really a, um, the DEP Green Infrastructure Plan, I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of my fellow agencies, so if there's anyone here from those agencies, please feel free to pipe up too. But 
uh, I don't want to speak incorrectly on anyone else's behalf, but um, there's a, a real uh, heavy focus in the green infrastructure plan on not just looking on, on how do you do this in, a, in, a, in an interagency context? Because the right of way, the street, is you know, there are about 15 or 20 agencies that have jurisdiction over different pieces of it. And in terms of capital improvements, coordinating that is a, a real administrative challenge. And so there's a very focused effort. There's a, an interagency task force that's working with the capital programs of all these agencies to identify ways to um, pair these kinds of uh, investments so that you know if um, the Parks Department is making an investment uh, in a sidewalk adjacent to a park, for instance, or if um, uh, the, uh, I'm just, you know, the Department of Transportation is making a change, or the, uh, the MTA, not a city agency, but also an important partner, um, is making a change. How do you look at the drainage of that street holistically? It's, it's a challenge because you can, you can, you can put, you know, the, the drainage of a street is complicated. Not every spot on the street is going to be an effective location for a stormwater tree pit. You know, they, the grading of streets is difficult to modify. It's relatively inflexible. So you really have to find where the opportunities are. And yes, you can't just push the water into someone else's, uh, you know, area of responsibility. The MTA, you know, also pumps an enormous amount of groundwater out, out of the subway system. And another set of efforts looks at um, how, what to do with that water. Do we just pour that water into the sewer system? Are there other things that we can do with that that will make more effective use of it? So those types of uh, interagency cooperation and collaboration are, are really, I think, absolutely critical to achieving real meaningful solutions. The Parks Department. Oh, how? <laughs> it's not, this Charles. Hi, Howard. Hi, Charles. Um, has city planning thought about different building forms other than the tower in order to um, improve the quality of life at the street level? Absolutely. Um, I, you know, in, in terms of quality of life at the street level, that's a, 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 an enormous um, focus of, of Amanda Burdens in, in particular. You know, I think that looking at uh, the street as a place, as a place of public uh, activity um, is, is hugely important. And actually, uh, as part of this set of uh, 109 rezonings, a large share of them have really um, steered us away from the 1961 zoning resolutions model of towers in the park, set back from the street, really divorcing the, uh, the, the buildings from the public realm and looking at street wall development, um, how we can make buildings engage with the street, improve the, uh, the public realm as well, looking at our commercial streets, looking at residential streets. Um, even in low density districts, we uh, um, put in place, uh, uh, you know, where, where towers aren't really the issue, but um, we, we put in place front yard uh, planting requirements so that people couldn't turn their front yards into paved over parking bays for, for uh, all the cars that they uh, couldn't fit in the side yards. I, I was just wondering if we're gonna ever consider a different sort of sky plane that sky uh, avoids shading the street so much. Avoids shading the street. You know, uh, there's a balance, I think. Um, you know, tower development in some senses reduces uh, shading in the sense that you have a narrower, uh, you know, uh, shadow that's cast across areas. You know, bulky street wall development can produce larger shadows for certain areas, but it, it really depends. Um, there are a lot of concerns, aesthetic, shade, um, and also density. You know, how do we uh, find the opportunities for density? Uh, we can't go down, <laughs> not for residential at least, uh, we can't go down, so we have to find ways to go up uh, in ways that are going to balance all those concerns. So um, looking at the interaction between uh, you know, there's some different and interesting ideas, certainly with uh, Teardrop Park in Battery Park City, how to look at harvesting sunlight from the tops of buildings and bringing it down into the park itself. There are all sorts of different ways that we can try to get at these types of issues. Thanks. Um, we're right on schedule. Um, uh, first, I wanted to thank uh, Howard for absolutely great talk, and I'm sure a lot, a lot of these issues